Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Dale H., Byron A., Peter S., Zach W., The Yellow Cake Advocate, Sean R., Safe A., and at Uranium Insider. On the show, it's been a while, returning guest, Mike Alkin, founder and chief investment officer at Sachem Co. Partners, a private fund based in New York that is focused on uranium investment. You can learn more about Mike, Sachem Cove, and their work at their website, sachemcovepartners.com. You can also follow Mike on Twitter at the handle at footnotes first. Mike, great to have you back on the show. Hey, Andrew. How are you? Thanks for having me. We're hanging in, man. Uh, things are going well here, and I suspect you're doing well in New York. Yeah, we are. We're not in New York City. We're we're a bit out uh, from the city, thank thank goodness. So it's been kind of quiet here, and uh, you know we've been hunkered down for a few months, but everyone's starting to uh, poke their head out again, and so hopefully this it continues. Yeah, absolutely. And money is certainly the driver, and we were talking about staying well, staying healthy, and now we have to, of course, with some of the things going up in the states, add the word "stay safe" as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's it's amazing. <laughs> it really is. I watch TV and I'm like, I don't recognize uh, you know the country sometimes with what's going on. So it's interesting. It's, it's time to get focused on what really matters, and I think that yep. there's been a disconnect, certainly in, on that front, degenerate type activities, which is really sad. So hopefully, uh, people get slapped back into shape, if you will. Yeah. Good, good for people to have a voice and uh, you know share their their views. Uh, could do without the violence portion of it. So add a little bit of logic to it. That would help. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, out of the gate here, Mike. Uh, just a couple administrative things, real quick. Uh, you're a keynote speaker at the upcoming Ozim Uranium 2020 conference. Can you just share mm-hmm. a little bit with the audience about what you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, so, you know, I think the title of our talk is Price is Everything. I, I think one of the things we'll share with Andrew is one of the things that uh, we're always uh, intrigued by, amazed by, uh, we saying, you know, Tim and I, when we talk to uh, Tim Chilary, is the, I'd say they're myths, right? We call them myths and myths that, the, the myths that are out there say that three times fast, um, uh, you, you know, around um, the basic numbers. I learned a long time ago from uh, one of my earlier bosses is, is master the obvious. And so, you know, and um, <clears throat> sometimes the what's staring right in the face and doesn't require uh, a rocket science degree. And really, you know, you've heard me say this, uh, anyone who's listened, uh, you know, all two people who care what I say <laughs> would be... Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's fourth grade math, um, but it is. And uh, there's there's, you know, to, it's common sense fourth grade math, and and just uh, caring enough to to dig a little deeper. And um, you know, one of the things that that we see all the time is, uh, oh well, all the, the Kazakhs are going to come out and they control this. It's um, well, the, the, everyone knows kind of what the Kazakhs have produced. Um, and then uh, when you think about how much more they can produce, um, it, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, uh, they can, and you'll see when, in our presentation, let's, let's actually have some fun with math and let's ramp them up and let's, just, let, let's say that they're, they're not going to be value over volume. And let's do that. Their production capabilities are, and 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 so let's have that aha moment that a bear might have on the, on the Kazakhs, and you'll see uh, as we'll lay it out. So what? Doesn't matter. Will it? Will the deficit? Would the deficit be a little less? Yes. Will the deficit still be stunningly big? Yes. Uh, and then we're going to do that for all the state-owned production. Uh, and we're going to kind of demystify. Let's 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 pretend that all state-owned producers who pre-COVID were producing, you know, 
at a 68% utilization rate of capacity. Let's let's get crazy and pretend that they all don't care about what they sell it at. And let's see what that matters. And, and let's take Olympic Dam, um, the big copper mine in Australia, and we're going to talk about Olympic Dam, and we're going to say, hey, let's let's pretend that they actually do spend a ton of money to expand that. And because uranium is a byproduct of the copper that they mine, <clears throat> let's get a little crazy and add a lot more production there. And let's and they don't really care what they sell it at because it's a byproduct. And let's throw that in there. Yep. And 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 now let's see what the numbers look like. And let's 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 throw Cigar Lake in there, right? Let's throw that back in there too. Um, and let's let's walk through some secondary numbers. And <laughs> And now we're going to see what, what what it looks like, and we're going to we're going to um, break down that myth of of well the Kazakhs can ramp up or that they won't be disciplined. Uh, we're not going to break down that myth that they won't do that. We're going to say let's see what it looks like if they do, and let's see if what's happening in the world of production in state-owned entities let's 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 ramp them up all the way, and let's so we're going to. To say, okay, let's let's say all that's right, and that's why we sleep. At, that's why we sleep like babies at night. <clears throat> so, you know, sometimes it's just the obvious, and and that's so that's kind of what I think. And it all comes down to price being everything, right? And that's we're talking about at these levels. And now we're going to share then with our view of how you layer in. Let's layer in some of these mines, right? And where should where do these other mines come in? How long do they take to come on? You know, we've done a, a lot recently uh, in the last couple of months of of talking about our view versus consensus. Consensus being a third party uh, consultant to the industry that has emerged as the bellwether forecaster, and we've we've shared our view and how we think uh, uh, the consensus numbers are nonsensical, um, and yep. uh, we, uh, we, with, which we've shared with with the, the major. Uh, uh, players in different parts of the fuel cycle, and we're, we're going to not go down that road anymore because there's enough out there uh, for that. But this is going to be more. Let's 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 approach why price matters. Why price is everything, and you know the the big thing you hear. Well, there's a ton. Of, there's so much uranium out there. Yeah, absolutely, there is. You know, it's everywhere. Uh, meaning, you know, in the ground, sure. But how much economic uranium is there? And and yep. uh, you know and same thing on the cost side, right? These these costs are magical costs. They're fairy dust costs. They're pixie dust, whatever you call it, um, <laughs> right? Costs are much higher. But but let's use the costs that mining companies use, and and why price matters and what those uh, what it looks like. So that's kind of where we're, we'll go. That's we've kind of put past, <clears throat> you know there. You know, consensus, as you will, you know, that the third party work, that's irrelevant uh, at this point because, you know, we we're, we we subscribe to it. We don't we, we just use it as just to actually uh, cook more comedy than anything else um, because the numbers just don't make sense. But we'll move past that and yeah. uh, go on to focusing on. What 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 some of the bear case can be and why um, we we feel pretty comfortable that it doesn't make sense. So yes. anyway, the end result looks very promising, fantastic. As you said, you sleep well at night. I do as well. And yeah, you guys have beat to death the consensus quite well. I've, they've been beat into submission. You know what? Let them keep forecasting low. That's fantastic. Absolutely, for absolutely. That's and look, you know, to the ex one of the things we don't spend a lot of time on. And we really do is, is with the sell side, you know, the, um, for those who are listening that don't know what the sell side is, it's, it's, it's the investment banks that write research on given industries. And, you know, the, the evolution of uranium uh, markets is after Fukushima, you know, the price collapsed. And, and a lot of the sell side, if you were a sell side uranium analyst, um, you, you, might have pro you might have probably lost your job. Um, and now, to the extent that they still even bothered looking at uranium, was typically a precious metals analyst or a base metals analyst. And because the fuel cycle is so complicated, um, you know, they would they rely on these outside consultants. Now, normally in an industry, the sell side analysts themselves are the ones generating 
the bottom, uh, the top down work, right? The macro uranium work and then the bottoms up work on the company. And, and they form their own consensus. <clears throat> it doesn't happen that way in uranium. It, not all, but almost all of the sell side cuts and pastes these third part, this third party work. And so you've had this consensus form around an entity. Right. And you say, wow, right. OK. And, and that's kind of scary to begin with. Um, so it's um, it, it's it's bizarre in that regard uh, yep. and how that has has all evolved. But but yeah, that's that's yesterday's news. You know, I don't even bother with what what they're thinking. So what we do spend some time on is uh, and normally we don't talk to the sell side, but we have more and more. As you dive deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into those numbers, and you just say, "Wow, this this doesn't make sense." That knowing that the sell side does does use that, <clears throat> we are happy to share with them our views to the extent that they want to listen. And and uh, we've been met with some very uh, open-minded folks, and so we'll we'll share that. But but that's that's like I said, that's now it's just about. Uh, sharing some sharing why prices everything you know well continue to shake it up it's fantastic and uh the g and a costs were not included in their uh forecast there's no doubt about that uh, oh and so many <laughs> uh, on, on, the, on the i mean everything right it's and you just see the evolution of it you know yeah. it's it's whatever so yeah <clears throat> well oh, i'm looking forward to the conference uh and checking out what you're doing there on that front and just for the audience uh go to uranium dot Ozim, that's Oz, I -M -M, dot com. So uranium dot Ozim dot com. We do have a discount for our members for the conference. So check out that website. And there's also a video about attendance and the networking setup, et cetera. So just check that out for the audience that are listening that are interested. Next item here, Mike, looking over the questions that we received for this show, it seems that you're missed in the community, which uh, I think uh, a lot of people share that thought. What caused you to slow down on the discussions? What happened to mm -hmm. the talking stocks over a beer with Curzio, and what can the audience expect going forward on this front? Uh, yeah, sure. Podcast took too much time, um, so you know it was interesting. It was an evolution for for me. I'm, I'm you know, I, most of my career I was a short seller where you don't know want anyone to know who you are, <laughs> and then as I as I, I started the uranium journey, as I saw. Before I ever poked my head out, it was almost a couple of years of just a deep dive into the into the industry and uh, learning it. You know, uh, over the years, you know, I think one of the great advantages of being an investor is being a kind of being a generalist investor, where you can just kind of hover and then um, see something that's interesting in the numbers or in in the narrative, and then. Uh, peel the onion back a little and then just keep peeling another layer and another layer. And and eventually something triggers you to want to keep going deeper and deeper. Um, and one of the things I've learned over the years, just through experience and many, many trials and errors, um, is uh, is being a, not being an expert, if you will, in anything is probably a, a real a great advantage because you're not – you're not burdened with um, you're not burdened with recency bias as much. Um, you still have to guard against it when you've been doing, but but you know yesterday's results doesn't mean that that's what's going to be tomorrow and in the future. And when you're in something and you're engrossed in it for a long, long time, and you're, you're, you know you've been doing it forever, you you kind of ebb and flow with the cycles. And and I believe everything is cyclical. And you tend to see it, and when you when you parachute in, and you kind of look, but you can't just parachute in and be a, a, a mile wide and an inch deep. If you're going to make a big capital commitment to it, you got to dive deep and deep and deep. And so, you know, having having uh, through my career been uh, uh, in the coal space, looking at steel, looking at aluminum, looking at the oil field uh, shale plays, looking at oil and gas. In my prior firm, we. We had a, a big commitment to to oil and gas and and understanding the oil field services, the agricultural cycle, just understanding cycles and how to try and think through cycles. And um, you know, no, you have to know fully well that you're not a um, you know, I'm, I'm not a mining engineer, I'm not a nuclear scientist, I am not a geologist, but understanding over time that 
knowing what you're not good at, or I shouldn't even say not good at, but what you're not expert at, and, and going out and finding finding people who are and asking a lot of questions. And so for for me, and, and, and I'll get you to the whole podcast stuff. So for me, for a couple of years, it was, hey, hey I'm not a geologist. I understand the basics. I understand uh, how natural resource companies, you know, what, what the what the playbook is. I understand, you know, where having just been exposed to them over the years, where some of the pitfalls are. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not a uranium mining expert. Um, so let, in, in a bear market, what you tend to find is there's a plethora of, of talent that's on the bench that's not working. And so you just go out and find them and you show up at conferences and you start talking to people and you, you send people emails, you read old articles and you find people and you, you come out and you say, hi, I'm new to the space. Here's what I do. And I'm learning about this. And you ask a lot of stupid questions because they are, you don't know what's a good question or not. And then you start to put a mosaic of information together. And then you learn where you really need to go and dive, right? And for me, it's always with the numbers um, is where I kind of do my diving. Anyway, after a couple of years of doing that and and then presenting publicly uh, on Real Vision at first, I think it was mid-17 probably, as I started to, to do that and then I became – uh, a little bit more of a public face. And I did that because I thought, you know, there's a thesis here and I'm reading uh, all the bear cases and I tried to solve the bear case. That's how I started looking at uranium. And and my God, I can't find a bear case that makes sense. And yep. um, if, you, if you come at it and you try and break the bull case and you try and prove the bear case, then okay, if you can prove the bear case, you go. And, and I couldn't do it. And, and that's when... Um, you know, I, as the, and then I started going on Twitter. I didn't even know what Twitter was. I, I had joined in 09, but I never, I forgot I, I was even on. I, I never looked at it for years and years and years. And then I start, a friend of mine who's pretty active on Twitter said, you know, you should go start sharing your views here. So I did. And one thing led to another. And, and then the podcast came around, I thought it would be a good idea to share. Uh, by this point, it was a few years in of, I'm saying, wow, I, I think, there's so many misunderstandings and the institutions aren't there. The retail investors um, are really uh, – uh, there's a lot of enthusiasts, enthusiastic people about it. But maybe I can just shed a little light on what I'm learning in the fuel cycle for a few years. And so I started doing that and uh, it, it became um, – you know, people would hear me on the podcast and you know, I talk about whatever goofiness was going on <laughs> In the first ten or fifteen minutes, uh, just you know, day to day of a of, of a of a dad and husband going through life, trying to fix things that didn't work. I enjoyed doing that, but but what I what I didn't want to do, and what I noticed is, look, I have a, a, a fairly strong view on on company, uh, the the uranium companies, the ones I believe are viable, the ones I believe are not viable. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a shorter list of what I think are really good companies than what I think are not good companies. So um, to fill up every week, to get people on every week, and then you start to go out, you have to go outside of uranium. And I don't want to give a platform for you. I did at first. I brought some yeah. uranium CEOs on. But I didn't want to yeah. give a platform because once you get past X number of companies, right, and you're bringing people on. I, I'm not going to give them that platform when I don't necessarily agree with what they're saying, right? So um, you you kind of – that shortens the list, and then you have to go outside. And, you know, when I'm all in on an industry, I mean, I'm all in. It's been that way my whole career. I've never – I've always been fortunate to really focus on a few things, one or two things at a time, big, you know, big sector bets or big industry bets. So then it requires, from a podcast standpoint, it really requires me to then have to start expanding beyond. I mean, I'm always paying attention to geopolitics, the global macro, what's going on. <clears throat> but but to start to bring guests on, it, it requires a lot of hours per week. Um, it requires going out and finding it. And it's just not what I do for a living, right? It became yeah. more and it, it took too much of my time. I, I didn't... Um, you know, my, my family is important to me. I don't want to spend six hours on a Sunday reading about a, a subject matter that is only going to be important to me because I, I have a guest on 
um, and then I'm on to something else. But when when right. when that time is better spent with my wife and kids or reading about uranium in a nuclear fuel cycle. So that was yep. really the genesis of that. And then as far as Twitter goes, um, you know, it's I, I don't have time for it and I don't have an interest in in getting into the, you know, uh, uh, you know, my name is out there. Your name is out there. And and we're out there, and we put our ourselves out there. Um, p- people hide behind their names, and that's fine. I get all that, right? And that that's good. Um, but I, I realized, uh, as you know, I mean, we've <laughs> look. We we could be wrong, by the way. I don't think we are. But when I speak to something, it's it's an informed comment that is supported by. At this point now, for it, <laughs> I mean tens of thousands of hours of research and numbers to support it. And I'm just not going to get, and you know, this is, I mean, layers, anyone, I don't know if you've ever done a screen share with us, I can't recall on our model, but there are some people in the industry who have. Um, and, you know, this, again, like I said, it doesn't mean we're right, but it means we're in, we're at least informed and, and we could, uh, uh, you know, we could be missing something. I, I hope we're not. I don't think we are. But it's all a buildup of years of research and numbers and that that form this. And so I'm not going to get into a drawn out debate with someone who's firing, you know, <laughs> just some knee slap answer or just some off the whim thing or some some comment they heard somewhere. I would spend all day on Twitter doing that. And then there's a portion of it where it's proprietary. Right. Most of it's proprietary because I have limited partners who are my investors and right. I'm not going to share with a, a, a universe. I'm happy to educate on the macro to the extent that I can educate to the extent that anyone cares what I said. And if they think they know, um, that's fine. I may or may not know what I'm talking about. Right. I think I think I do, but I might not. Um, so yep. it's I, I just don't want to get drawn into the debates. And, and I know myself. Right. And you, I think it's important to know who you are. And um I'm a grinder, and I'm, um, uh, I always try and take the high road. But if I see someone coming at me who's uninformed, um, uh, you know, I'm going to punch somebody in the proverbial analytical face, right? So, and um, uh, there's no, what's the point of that? It doesn't make any sense to to, to fight with Bob in his mom's basement. Um, who's hiding behind some name that has no, and I'm, I'm going to say, you know, with, 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 it just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a good use of my time. So, um, yep. so yeah. you know what I mean? So, so that's kind of oh, it. Yeah. And I, I, I watch it. And the other thing I decided was, you know, the companies, I, I see a lot of this is, you know, junior mining, man, it's, it's a, they're in business to raise capital. Right. And so, um, they're like biotech companies. And so there's, they always have a great story to tell. And I see some stories that I just don't agree with and I'm, but I'm not going to get into that publicly with, with um, getting into that because you know, you're, you're fighting, you know, all day long. So anyway, uh, I watch it. I, I, you know, I, 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 I'm, in, I, I check it, you know, every few days. Um, but that's pretty much it. And then I just decided that, you know, we'll put some con- content out, whether it's at a conference or a webinar or doing a talk with you. And, you know, um, and I, when you originally said you want to come on, I said no, right, because I'm just kind of winding that down. But, I, you know, I like you. I, you put in a great effort. You do you do uh, really nice, thoughtful work. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come on there. But so, yeah, yeah it's just – it's just um, yeah, it's just proprietariness. It's just um, – uh, we, we we've done this, and again, I always say this: we could be wrong, but but at least at least if you're going to get into a debate with someone, come armed with the facts, and uh, and we can debate the facts. But I'm not going to debate just nonsense. So anyway, yes, that's... fully understood, Mike. And there's a lot of stuff. The natural resource sector is an evil sector. There's some jewels, mm-hmm. and we have uh, in some cases the tailwinds of cyclicality in the sector. Yeah, but. Yep. Certainly, um, on the podcast side, I completely understand less is certainly more in this case. And I fully understand the amount of time that you've put into your stuff when you were doing it. We've generally stepped back from Twitter. We have uh, some frequent comments. It's kind of repetitive. And then we have some some custom comments at different times. But yeah, you're right. Less is more in this case. The amount of time it takes to run a podcast. Uh, when I started this, 
never expected the amount of time unless you have a staff that does it all for you it's very time consuming but it's tough to do that if you're going to stay informed with your guests and stay engaged and exactly uh, and yep. and and you know and it, it is andrew and and that's it right if so if i, I go hire someone and, and go book people but i'm not a media company right i was nope. just a I was just a doofus that decided to share a few thoughts with with you know about uranium, uh, and and a couple of goofy things that happen on a daily basis in my personal life, and I, I enjoy that aspect of it. Um, but you know you, yep. you might not get that from the podcast. But I'm an introvert, and you know I, I'm I'm perfectly happy at my desk looking at numbers all day long and reading about uh, or talking to people about nuclear power and uranium. So to go outside of that, it's 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 a lot. It's just, it's just more than I, I I have time for right now. I think the value is is better spent in other places. And uh, yep. yeah, same for us. You know, just trying to keep a guest list. You know, of course we cover more than just uranium, but the guest list, uh, dealing with the guests. Um, you know, it's a lot, right? It is. It, we it's a lot. And of course we've had guests on our show, as you know, that we don't agree with either. <laughs> <laughs> but we make yeah. that known in one way or the other. But yeah. uh, let's move on here. I, I just want to yeah. update on one other thing that came about as I was uh, putting together stuff over the last few days for the show. Uh, Superior Lake Resources and Premier Uranium. Can you speak just briefly about that release? Yeah, um, sure. I guess about 18, uh, not quite, May, it was somewhere 15, 18 months ago, we, we were approached by a couple of folks uh, that are geologist, mining engineer with a familiarity for um, the U.S. space. And, you know, I, I guess it, it opens it up to a broader discussion, right, as to uh, it, investing in natural resources, great as king versus uh, uh, the mining methodology and, and all sorts of stuff. I think uranium is somewhat funky and different in terms of all of that, you know. And if you, I think about my, my, my thesis is, as, the, as, as as we think about the the global uranium space, you know, one of the things that's always intrigued us about the U.S. is a couple of things: is um, th there is a, uh, and I think you and I might have talked about this offline, probably in the past. I look at the U.S. uranium sector, and I look at the amount of general and mid GNA general administrative expenses spent. You know, it's like thirty-five to forty million dollars spent to produce like hardly any uranium, right? Amongst a number of companies and, um, and their costs are higher. There's no doubt, right? I mean, they have a bigger regulatory burden than other parts of the country. They have higher labor costs. Everything is just more expensive. But as, as we think about the uranium uh, world, um, you know, we were, at, I think I, I was doing a podcast at the time and I said, 232 is noise, 232 is noise. And I, I'd always say that and I, I, and people would say, well, what do you mean it's noise? And, and everyone was focused on 232 and the nuclear fuel working group. And, and if our thesis is right, um, there's a major shortfall now and, and for, for the next decade in the amount of uranium produced. And our view has always been, just, just a. If you're a U.S. miner, you don't have to sell to just U.S. utilities. It's a big world out there, right? So you can sell outside the U.S. And there are other countries around the world. When you're producing a million, two million pounds of uranium, there's there's a number of countries. It doesn't take many two hundred, three hundred thousand pound contracts to fill up your order book. So a. You can look outside the U.S. And then b. If you're really focusing on on the, the supply demand dynamics. Um, you'd see that prices are going to start coming your way uh, much sooner than later. Um, and I'm going back to like 2017, 2018. Um, and, and price will get there. You are higher cost, right? There's nothing wrong with that. They're not everyone. And, and as we'll lay out in prices, everything, the first tier producers don't solve the, the nuclear power utility problem for supply. It just doesn't happen. It's not even close country mile, it's not even close. So it, so if you just step back, and I think one of the biggest eye openers we have had, or I have had, and I say, when I say we, I'm talking about Tim, and we have a couple of Tim, but Tim, Tim, Tim Shalari and I, when we talk to, to me, one of the biggest eye openers in this sector has been for us is I don't ever recall looking in a quarter of a century of looking at companies, an industry where people allocating capital for a living on, who are allocating the capital within corporations to capital expenditures 
whether it's in terms of building something or exploring for something or drilling and all of this stuff, don't really have a view, most, and not all, but the majority of them don't have a view on the cycle. And again, this goes back to that third party that everyone focused on. And 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 the 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 lack of curiosity in saying, well, what if they're wrong? Who are these? Who is this third party? What is this like a? Why are they the anointed one? Who? <laughs> where did they? Because they've been around. That means they're right. Um, and so, and then as you start to do the math, and, and we said, holy, sh- holy shit, look at this. Like this is this is crazy. Um, how wrong this is. And and now let's go find out why. And then when we find out the why and and the wherewithal and how the sausage is made, we say, holy crap. But but you you see, so if if the whole universe, and there are exceptions to this within the industry, but few. Um, So, but if you don't, if you're not curious about the supply demand dynamics and what's going to turn the cycle, right? Um, uh, we go back and look at I, – I, I'm going to get off on a tangent here, but I hear about the false dawns. It's another false dawn. What the – what what planet are you people on that talk about false dawns? Um, if you were buying uranium stocks before 2017, you, there was no false dawn. There was, a, there was ridiculous equity buying. There was no case to be had, right? So there was no case. There was oversupply. There were there were there were uranium companies drilling and exploring and pumping out and raising capital like drunken sailors. No offense to sailors. I like sailors. Thank God for sailors. But but that's what they were doing. Right. That's they were. And you hear about the false dawns. Uh, Bullshit to false dawns. Right. Sorry if, if you got if you lost money in that those false dawns, but they weren't fundamental dawns, right? Uh, they, they weren't fundamentally there. And so, so now you have all this space. I think we, I think I started talking publicly about uranium. It was like 22, 21 to $23 a pound. And it was always something, well, you know, if, and, and, and as you look back and look at it, okay, well, the, the, the stories coming out of the companies on the nuclear, it's, it's been the same for seven years. Well, Japan's going to come back online and this and that and the whole thing. It, it was predicated on Japan coming back online. Those, that it wasn't ready, right? Now we've had this. So now you fast forward to, to this whole, uh, you ask about the U.S. and the question was on Superior and, and how I'll get there. So the whole question was on um you know, the if the market just did what it needed to do, and we we estimated that eighteen nineteen, you're starting to get into deficit, and it gets bigger, and the and and the horses left the barn on what mines need to be built. Step back, and um, and the market will come to you. You can sell outside, but we didn't see that. We saw this this trade policy action take place, and that did put a pause. Right, it was one of those things where the pause uh, from the fuel buyers. Um, and uh, took and it was real, right? Where are we going to have to buy our uranium? You know, one of the things people think contracts might just appear. They take for oh, not forever, but they take months and months and months to negotiate. And you know, most of the deals are done. They call them off-market transactions, right? They're not done via request for proposals or RFPs. The majority of them are done off market, and those are negotiated, and they take a long time, and there's many factors into them. And so, our view on uranium has been: price will have to go higher, and um, if you wait, they'll come to you. We don't see that, but but our view has also been: as we look through the U.S., we we look at high G&A costs, we look at multiple players kind of dispersed and spread out. Um, But but somebody came to us, uh, a couple of guys came to us and they said, hey, there's some interesting projects. And what happens in the U.S. is uh, in many parts, not not every, some is private property, but the the, there's land that's available from the U.S. government where there might have been drilling that was done and a company couldn't afford to keep the leases. And you can go out and look for it and 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 you can go and and you get some drill data and you could see what's available and so we um so we said okay well 
uh, let's spend some time uh, going through this and you could stake some claims and we looked at some projects uh, and again with the with the advice of some guys who've been doing this for a very long time and and uh, and as we saw that we said you know we'll we'll make a an investment into a few different areas where we can see where there has been some work done and there's the potential um, and that over time as this market evolves uh, you know, the world looks right now at what they're looking at. It's the uranium world. It's focused on where this market is today. And we're saying, OK, well, well, you know, the U.S. Uh, uranium market could look a little bit differently uh, as time evolves. We think that those who can produce pounds will produce pounds because there's not enough pounds over the next uh, decade. Um, so our view was, you know what, we'll put a, toe, a, a, a foothold in here and we'll see where this goes. And, and uh, you know, we, like I said, we, we and we'll share more uh, at, at our conference, but there's, uh, there's an opportunity, we think, um, in, the, in the U.S. And again, you have to, you, you, you can't be delusional. You have to know, uh, are there big, massive mines out there that could come online? Yes. Are they high-grade mines? Yes. Um, are there, uh, well, they'll take many, they're needed. They'll come online. They'll take years to come online. But there's also a place, we think, for lower-grade uh, mines that could come on a little bit, so, uh, a little bit sooner. Uh, yeah. There's potential for a little bit more exploration. You know, it's not one size fits all. And right. so, and what what you tend to see is people take sides, and they're very it's very polarizing. So, um, so that's what so so we were uh, approached um, uh, by a, a, a guy who's done this before in the industry and um, uh, in the uranium space, uh, and that 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 is with Superior Lake and 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 uh d did it down in australia and other parts of africa and and said hey i'm you know kind of looking at doing a few things and i i see some i, I kind of have a vision for the for the space in in the us and again not to, not no delusions of grandeur as to as to um you know it, you're not this these aren't high grade uh prospective targets or high grade type things it, it is what it is but we think the is what it is might have a use uh, down, as the cycle unfolds. So anyway, so we were approached and we own uh, 100% of these uh, different claims. We were approached to have some due diligence done on them. We do some diligence on the other side. It goes both ways, and 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 that's kind of kind of what it is. But but we could see a role uh, for the U.S. There are those who strongly believe the U.S. has no role in the uranium market going forward. We're uh, we we believe that the 232 is actually a hindrance. It didn't start the contracting cycle. The nuclear fuel working group delayed things a little bit and uh, a lot. Right? I mean, with that, what's going to happen there? And so, but we think all of that is just time, and that time has made uh, the deficits even more. And so, uh, we think there are things to do in the U.S. Again, we're not. We have no part of if 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 this were to come to a if this comes to uh, if we wind up agreeing and it comes to, it's an option to do you know right so it's an option that they can look at our work we can uh, look at them if it comes to a closure um, we don't manage it we just have sold uh, sold what we in what we made an investment in a while back and and see where it goes from there um, yep. but I think uh, you know the guy behind it is is a thoughtful guy and and kind of thinks a few steps ahead um, as you know it's it's uh, as to what the US could look like and so um, you know uh, it's about mining right it's generating scale and are there pockets in the US where you can generate economies of scale so yeah so that's that's kind of kind of kind of what it is but we you know for if if it went uh, and it closes we would we would just be a shareholder you know no active role in anything Yep. Yeah, Mike, what states do you like for these jurisdictions? Obviously, we have Wyoming, uh, Utah, Colorado mentioned here. And then these particular projects, are they on state, federal lands, BLM? What do we have there? Yeah, it's, it's uh, mostly uh, mostly BLM, some state. I, I Look, in general, I think Wyoming is an interesting state. Um, it's an agreement state, right? So it makes approvals easier for things. But there's a lot of real pounds there that when you start to put a, a couple to few million pounds together, you, you, you know, you're not a first tier producer. Again, 
I, and again, I go back to what the what everyone. Well, the Kazakhs can produce ice or so much less. No shit, right? Well, well, it's the Olympic Dam. No shit. Now, now put some context around it again. Again, right? Who cares? They're already factored in. Um, is it lower grade stuff? Yep. Is it? But but is it? Uh, you know, ISR mining is is uh, is is uh, has uh, flex up, flex down capabilities. Um, and you know, if 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 a thoughtful person were were to put together uh, in in this in that state some 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 projects, then you 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 can make a run at being a competitive producer. Um, and uh, you know, you can. Yeah, so that's that's just kind of what we think. Yep. Um, you know, again, uh, there's there's there it, we think in this cycle that's unfolding. There's a role for some different types because it's not as simple as a couple of mines coming online and that solves the problem. It's just not. Uh, that's our view. It's not that way. Right. Yeah, I, I certainly like uh, Utah, Wyoming are fantastic states, not just for mining. But yep. just just good states. They're they're well done. Uh, Idaho is yep. another one that's fantastic. Uh, not a fan of Oregon. Uh, I think Oregon has tons of challenges. So I, I think that that one's going to be quite a difficulty there. But we'll see. I, I definitely know about that project in Oregon. And back to your other statement. You know, people when you said 232 was noise. What matters is the term contracting. That's what matters. The, the rest of this crap is a sideshow. That's just how it is. Because as you yeah. and I talked earlier offline, look. You have one change of the administration. You can throw all that stuff, throw it right in the trash can. If, if someone else gets elected, it's possible all this goes away. So don't don't ever depend on it. And what counts for the sector is term contracting, as you know. The nine most dangerous words in English language is, I'm here from the government and here uh, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. You know, so yeah. didn't Reagan yeah. say that? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it. I think it's incumbent upon companies to build a company that will uh, survive that, and uh, and to uh, you know if if prices do it what what we think they can and and they 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 move higher, there's a place for those pounds. And so, yeah. Uh, but you know, in the moment, people tend to 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 not focus on that, right? And the moment, and, and uh, it's uh, 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 Chilary says this, and I laugh, is why do people focus on spot? Because it's the spot price, because it's the only it's the only thing in the blinking lights of the screens that people look at that, that once a day will tell you what, what it is, and people ascribe the value of a company or an industry to that. Yeah. Uh, when at the end of the day, it is about term contracting, and it's, you know, <clears throat> we, uh, the, the, the fuel buyers, for for us for me, it's always about what are people's incentives. It comes down to what what what's the incentive. And uh, you know, fuel buyers are extremely bright people. Many of them are nuclear engineers, right? And they're not just sitting there buying uranium all day long. I mean, that's a very small portion of what their time is spent. They they come to the market very infrequently. They secure long term contracts. Sometimes they do mid term, shorter term. Sometimes they'll buy a drop in the spot market. But really, right. really bright people. But their incentive is not. Is they're they're not financially incentivized structurally, organizationally, to pay the, the it, uh, to to buy at the bottom, right? They buy where others buy, um, uh, because it's a smaller percentage. You've heard me say this: it's a smaller percentage of the cost to operate a nuclear power plant is uranium, and so um, what does ultimately matter to them is understanding that there's this supply. Now, what you've been having to overcome with them for years, and rightfully so, is there was an abundance of supply. But those inventories have been drawn down. And and it's at those inflection points where I love investing. I, I believe all businesses are cyclical, but in these deeply, deeply cyclical businesses, it's at the inflection points where the strongest recency bias occurs. And uranium is on steroids because of the very, very few active participants that hold other parties accountable. You know, in, if you're investing in a technology space, well, those cell site analysts are um, doing their own work and they have 
legions of buy side investors, mutual funds and hedge funds doing their own analysis on the space and things get priced in relatively quickly. But in this, when in spaces are left for dead and abandoned and the unique nature of this is the reliance upon this main one one entity to provide insight to the whole, every side of it, fuel buyers and, and traders and sell side and, and because the institutions haven't cared, it's left to go unfettered. And, and, and so now you take the psychological recency bias if you're a fuel buyer, oh shit, prices have been low for eight years, there's always supply out there. Yeah, I get it, because there has been, right? And so you need something to draw them to that table. And you were starting to see that in in late 17 and early 18 uh, until until the 232 filing, and then and then that just kind of pulled everyone away from the table. And then the nuclear fuel working group uh, stuff. And but here you are again, and and now what you you know you experience is uh, you saw Cameco add some pounds in in 2019 to their order book, and. Uh, you know, and then you fast forward now, and again, they, now now nuclear fuel working group comes out, and now they start to focus on okay, COVID comes along, so now fuel buyers are focusing on refueling outages and making sure they have their their fabricated fuel bundles, and then let's work our way down to make sure our EUP is going to be an enriched uranium product, which is the, the end result of the uh, uh, enrichment process, that it's going to that that we have everything secured, transportation is going to be okay, but all the while. There's the fundamentals for stronger uranium prices just keep getting better because yeah. there's there's contracting hasn't uh, occurred in mass yet and and now if I'm a if I'm a producer if I'm a major producer you know the whole COVID thing if you think about the COVID thing uh, you know so Cigar Lake went offline the Kazakhs went offline now the Kazakhs you know the production in the first half of the year wasn't affected it's because those well fields are acidified it's it's the back half of the year where production comes offline. Um, because uh, they haven't been doing well field development. But, you know, if you think Cigar Lake uh, comes down, it's 18 million pounds a year, it's a million and a half pounds a month, and they um, they start, they stay, uh, uh, you know, it, it comes down, it's been down a few months, right? And so um, uh, Camco just hasn't been out there pounding. So what are they having to buy? from that lack of production. They have a little, not a lot, but they have a little bit of inventory and they've been uh, buying a little bit, uh, buying a reasonable amount in the market. Um, <clears throat> but but if you think about when when the, the price that needs to be is 50 plus and it was at 23 and you've only had a few, you know, uh, the month of April, you saw uh, 21 million pounds trade in the spot market. You saw 9 million in March, 21 million in April and uh, 5 million in May and only a couple of million pounds this year. This month, I mean, if there was all this excess pounds out there, if Cameco and a couple of and, and Arano were out there buying, did a, did did that drove the price up? And now in in May, when it goes down to five million pounds, if there's all these excess pounds, uh, and now two million pounds, wouldn't these sellers would be out pounding the market? Um, but they're not, and you know, and and people look at it and say, well, how come it hasn't kept going up? Because that's that's not healthy. It consolidates. It takes a little breath. There's there's the inner workings of the of the market, which there are off take agreements that occur. You know, the traders buy from. They have off take agreements where they'll take some pounds in, and you saw it in March, April, and May, and they price at the end of the month. So the traders try and pound the price down so their off take price is lower, and they haven't been able to do it. They haven't been able to pound it down like they like to. Um, so there's all, all these things taking place, but it's it's right. people stare at the spot market when it's a term contracting market, and that, that's that right. is, you know. So let's move on here. Uh, <clears throat> let's get into yep. some other questions. I want to change direction, as you know, and, and discuss some more specific things and talk a little bit about your experience, a little more detail on, I guess, really uh, more focused towards the equity side. Well, first off, during COVID. You mentioned that uh, in March, the sell-off in COVID, we had uh, we got to saw the equities uh, get crushed along with everything else in the market. What did you guys do internally, Mike? Can you just speak to how the fund deployed? Uh, did you guys put more capital into positions during that time? Did you guys do nothing? What was the thought process when this happened, Mike? Uh, we were buying uranium. <laughs> buying uranium stuff, buying uranium equities, not uranium. We were buying uranium equities. Absolutely, you know that that was it was uh, a market 
just a general market meltdown and everything kind of, you know, because of just panic and fear about what the unknown was. And um, it just made uh, the, the names we like uh, cheaper for uh, for us to buy. And, you know, we, we uh, yeah, we deployed capital. And uh, we deployed cap- capital in March and we deployed it in April. And, you know, you saw a big snapback in April. But that's, you know, I... Um, that was that was a market meltdown. Um, you know, I don't, Andrew. It's funny. I don't, um, and uh, I, I don't stare at the screens. I just don't. And you know, our our our, our largest investor and I joke a lot about it. Is, is uh, who, who we speak with you know, fairly frequently. Um, uh, th- there could be days I don't even know what the stock prices did um, because you know I we have a we have a trader and 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 Tim they'll they'll flag me on something, but. I, I don't care what stock prices are doing day to day. I, I just um, do. I ultimately care where they go. Of course I do. But you know, some days are up, some days are down. Um, but we're our, you know, my time is definitely better spent on on worrying about uh, where I could be wrong in the model, where I could be wrong in the in the narrative that that is in the marketplace, and and trying to continuously prove where we are wrong. And as long as I can't do that, um, if stocks get a little cheaper. Um, then we're we're going to deploy uh, some you know so we always have a little bit of cash around and uh, we put cash to work so that's yes. what we were doing yep perfect and I thought there was a, a fantastic opportunity to do so so I'm glad you guys yep. took advantage of it and uh, yep. we wish we had there was a little bit more time there but you never know what'll happen next but yeah fantastic opportunity not just in uranium uh, lots of places let's move on here so going back to 2017. You know, you've been in this sector for quite a while, just as long as I have. And certainly both of us, uh, you know, we released our first nuke report in 2017, officially became bullish in 2017. And over the time, Mike, we've had a generous amount of time to look back at our experiences. What are some just basic lessons that you've learned that have either benefited your position now or cause you to adjust your approach to the equity investments made in the sector. Can you just speak briefly to that? Yeah, sure. So I, I think for for us, you know, we started Sachem Cove in June of eighteen, I think it was. So if I early so what uh, spring summer seventeen, when I started talking publicly about it, wherever the price was, so say it was twenty two three dollars, something like that. Um, <clears throat> You know, uh, I didn't uh, anticipate uh, a Section 232 uh, uh, coming out. I didn't. I, it wasn't even really on my radar screen. Section 232. Um, it's 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 infrequently used. It's not something I I that was part of my calculus. Um, and I would say, okay, so from that standpoint, that came out, and uh, you know, when when 232 came out, the, the Department of Commerce didn't even need to pick a, pick it up, right? So there was this this overhang that in, in early 18 that they could have not. There was no time limit for them to have to even say we'll investigate it. And then uh, when they picked it up. Then they had nine months to do it. And again, you don't know, is it going to be two months? Is it going to be lip service? Is it going to be six months or nine months? Uh, so there's that unknown <clears throat> that you, that I, I guess you just say, well, how will that, that put a pall? I think for me, the biggest uh, eye-opener um, has been um, the the on all sides and, and I, I touched upon this earlier is with the exception of some and but the majority of folks all around the fuel cycle um d- 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 just has just d- don't dive deep and 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 there's a victim attitude everywhere and um and the recency biases i i hate to keep harping on that but it's you know we're pariahs. The fuel buyers and the traders can't stand us, right? We are, an, we are. They think an outsider, an interloper that's come in and creating havoc um, with an opinion. Uh, obviously, the third party's not pleased with us, even though we're a subscriber. They can cancel us any day. That'd be fine. Doesn't matter. We we got what we need now. Um, uh, but and we didn't know that. We just knew the numbers didn't make sense, but now we see how sausage is made. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but 
but the uh, I, I, so I, I think the complacency I think the has has been a surprise. Um, you know, there like I said, we speak to fuel buyers, we speak to traders. Uh, they try and play us, right? So I don't think they appreciate that um, their narrative doesn't mean it's the right narrative, and their narrative isn't supported by the facts and the math. And again, I'm not that great in math, but I'm good at fourth grade math. And that's what this is. And it's hunting and grinding and pounding and digging and digging and peeling it back and spending thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon hours laying it all out in spreadsheets and, and connecting them and seeing the moving parts and how they work. And we know from doing that, Tim and I know from talking to them, um, they don't do it. Or if they do, they, because they, they rely upon someone else. And right. um, now, are there some few buyers that do it? Absolutely, there are. And like I said, they're really bright people. So a hell of a lot smarter than I am. Um, and, and we have enormous respect for what they do. But um, again, they're, they're not, it's not part, you know, a fuel buyer who goes in and says to his boss, hey, boss, I just called the bottom here. Um, let's go load the boat here at $23 a pound. There's no upside for him if uranium gets to 80, right? But if he, if he, if he makes that call at 23, um, and it goes to 10, you know, that, that's kind of like a, 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 that's your job. And, and there's no, it's, it's not like financially incentive to make that call because you don't, you don't share in the upside and, and structurally it doesn't work that way when you see how the bureaucracies work within there. Um, yep. and on the trading, the trading side has surprised us. Um, uh, we speak to a, a trader that, that models and does nice work and has a good, we think a, a, an appropriate view. Uh, but many of them don't again, smart guys, but, uh, they've lived off the carry trade, right? Uh, uh, for, for many years, uh, let's go sell forward a couple of years. Let's go, uh, contract out a couple of years. We'll get a higher price than the spot price. We'll, we'll make the spread and there's always uranium out there and that's kind of how it works. And, and we can tell when we're talking to people, you know, this started, you know, three, four years ago and, and talking to the people we talk to and, and we're, I'm very honest, Hey, I'm not a uranium expert learning the space. Let's talk. And then you can tell as these conversations evolve, uh, they still do what they do every day and not recognizing what we're doing every day and how deep we're diving. And, um, at, at there becomes, it kind of comes a crossroads where you say to yourself, <laughs> okay. Um, we know from doing the work what the numbers are, and I could tell you haven't, and you keep with that narrative. And I think that has surprised um, in terms of uh, an a unwillingness to recognize the changing market. Well, not an unwillingness, but slow to it to, for them to be slow to recognize a changing market. Um, so that has been, uh, but you, you, it's all. That will take care of itself, right? Uh, yep. That 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 takes care of its price. Will take uh, uh, supply demand will take care of itself, right. um, and so so that in terms of the equity portion of it, uh, you know, the way from when we started to 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 now is, you know, we kind of have a view of of the important um, regions, but it, it, this is where the kind of the art of investing comes in, right? As um, if there's a region of the world that we think might play an important role um, in, in uranium production, but it's two years ago, a year and a half ago, whenever it was, when uh, yeah, two years ago now, when the fund was, was launched. Uh, and, and we know that uh, the fundamentals that we believe are there haven't yet come. And you know, this is a three to five year time horizon, how we think about this when, when, when we got into this. So, um, if that's if it's not obvious yet, if 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 the market's still working off of first order thinking and not second order thinking, well then I'm not going to heavily overweight something and just sit there, right? So I'm, I'm going to watch how it evolves and then to start to deploy more capital as the thesis starts to un, not it starts to evolve the way we've seen it, but the market starts to adapt to it and starts to get comfortable with it, and then then we'll 
be there earlier, but we'll start to deploy more capital uh, into there as the fundamentals start to become more and more obvious. Um, so it's it's just a little bit of the art of positioning um, the portfolio. But I would I would say to your question, biggest surprise is it's it's the un uh, not unwillingness, but it's the how stuck in their ways some of these people are, and it's it's not a it's not a market. The phys, these physical you're in, this isn't it's an industry. It's not even a market. The lack of commercial savviness is surprising, um, but again, it goes back to financial incentives. It's not there, and and I right. think ultimately they'll pay the price for it. Mike, as you guys have looked at different equities over the years, you guys have had the pleasure, just like I have, to sit back and look at these filings, to watch these management teams, to watch yep. each each action of these people over multiple years, and you can start to establish yep. patterns of, of what they're doing. Absolutely. And, and based on that, based on your meetings with different equity management teams, watching what they do, watching the filings, watching how they spend their money, over that time frame, what things have come to mind? Have you changed positions over learning more about those individual equities over time? And then would you say that management in this sector is king and everything else is queen? Um, I would say management in any sector is very important. You know, I think management, uh, you want somebody who's a good steward of capital to to be at the helm and who's aware. Um you know, one of the things we do a lot is we talk to, not all, but the management, we talk to companies that we are interested in. And, um, as, you know, obviously in the Uranus, you speak to most of them at first, and then you start to weed. You can tell pretty quickly who doesn't have a clue um, or who's just getting a, a paycheck, right? I mean, um, uh, and then there are those, and it, and then this comes into, you know, portfolio management too, right? So, one of the things I see a lot of, uh, and this is, in, and, and it's a learning process for me too, right? Where, uh, for, for I, I was in a cocoon for many years, for, for twenty plus years, I was in a cocoon of institutional management investing, and uh, at funds with with you know billions of dollars of capital, where you're investing in in medium size, some small, definitely some small, but mo mainly medium and bigger size companies. And um, it, it's and what moves it is the institutional uh, uh, capital flowing in and out of the space. Um, you get to sectors like uranium where they're so blown up, and you know you've got your speculators in there, uh, and um, and uh, the, the 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 more retail speculators, and and that lends itself to management teams who, you know. Uh, that could, and I don't know how to say this, but prey on them, right? Because there's really smart speculators, and they're real, I'm sure, brilliant at what they do for a living. But there are just little nuances of investing sometimes uh, that you just know just from doing it. And so, uh, as you know, part of what we have to learn are who are the folks that are the really good promoters that might not have great projects. Who are the folks that um, that have really good projects and might not uh, might undersell them, right? And who are the folks that are somewhere in between? And uh, so you watch that. Uh, and what we do and and is is we do these uh, meetings and phone calls with them. And over time, you know, we ask a lot of the same questions over and over each time because we know the answers. For, and but. We know the answers they've given us. We want to see how consistent they are. And, you know, you look for those changing stories, right? You look for the just the tone and the narrative and and what they're trying to focus you on. And if something that they were focusing people on in the beginning didn't work, work out like they thought, now all of a sudden they've got a new shiny toy that they're excited about. So, we, you know, you pay attention to those things. It's just a feel, it's consistency, and and that forms your opinion, uh, you know. But but again, to portfolio management, uh, and one of the reasons I never talk about publicly, I never pitch what we own because a I've, I've always said this, and what I own doesn't mean a it doesn't mean I'm right, and b it doesn't mean that you should own it because I own it, and and c it might be a 
half a percent position in my fund where you might see uh, and is, uh, you might hear that we own it. It might could be a one percent, a half a percent. And if it went to zero, it doesn't mean anything, right? It's a rounding error on performance. Yep. But but maybe I think there's if the market is is and the stars and the moons align, I could see a I could see how this could be a you know a ten x, and I'm making it up, right? Um, but it's all about context of where it fits in my portfolio, right? So I, I might have a bucket of those type of names that could be five, six, seven hundred basis points, which would be you know five to seven percent. And it, I'm, I'm not saying that's exactly what it is, but it could be around that ballpark where I think, okay, right. you know. There's enough here where there might be something. I'm really not sure. I, I'm not going to devote the time because it's a very small portion of it. Um, you know, uh, but but I'll have a little piece there. And um, but you know, whereas uh, the others, and 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 just like with the with the bigger names, medium sized positions and bigger positions in our portfolio. You know, you're constantly challenging management teams and testing them and asking the same questions and seeing what's going on. And yeah, look, this is a space where, you know, I, I see sometimes uh, folks will say, I, I'm, I, 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 I emailed the management and they got right back to me and I'm doing a call um, or something like that. Well, it, it, that that's not necessarily a good thing, right? Why did they get back to you right away? Um, you know, and and uh, you like them to be out really busy, <laughs> um, and I, I think there there are some management teams in the space that are aware that they're always in the need to raise capital, and they're always available, and you just got to be careful of stuff like that. When you look at the sector, Mike, and you look at the the different opportunities from the explore side, the develop side, the produce side. And when you look at the, you, you mentioned promotional side, maybe someone that's more promotional and liquid, they're promotional, but maybe, they're, maybe their assets, maybe their abilities to actually operate a mine are not there. When you look at the, the risk versus reward, the thought process in some of the community that thinks that all boats rise with the tide, obviously we mm -hmm. know some will do much better than that. Where mm -hmm. do you think the real outperformance lies in this market when you look at the equities, Mike? Do you think it lies across the different things we discussed, or do you think that there's one segment that really probably will outperform better, say, people that are capable of operating mines versus people that are just capable of promoting a story? Yeah, you know, it's a great question, and I think it depends on where you are in the up equity cycle. You know, a lot of times, you know, you see some of these really little crappy ones that can have monster moves, right? Because people get all excited and, and they get the promoters out there. And again, you know, if if, if we're, uh, we're cognizant of who those are, and, and if we think a company has nothing, <laughs> then they're not in the portfolio. If if we think that there's a little something, if some things go right, they could produce a, whatever, and you know we'll have a little bit. Um, but ultimately, we think that it's it comes down to management quality and it comes down to project quality. And you know we we think about it if you are um, if you can produce in the next uh, when when not the next we think we're in it, but uh, if you can produce uranium when these utilities are begging for it, uh, you are going to command a premium. And uh, we think if you're uh, if you in in the near term can go into development, you're going to command a premium. And um, and and by the way, in our top positions, we're perfectly comfortable. I'm perfectly comfortable with having upside that is less than I could find in others. But I feel that there's more certainty to realize that upside. So I'm willing to give up. Yep. You know, we're not dreamers, right? So. I might have in the top positions of my portfolio something that I could pencil out, and I'm, I'm you know, uh, three, four, five, uh, six x upside. And others, you could say, wow, this and this thing could be much more than that. Yeah, but but the chances of getting there are not nearly as good. And 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 oh, by the way, I'm I, I kind of think that whatever CEO that might be is full of shit. So um, and we've done some work and we've spoken to. You know, because all these projects, we speak to people who've worked at them. That's a beautiful thing about a bear market is there's all these folks around the industry um, that have worked at these projects. And you can talk to them right. and, yeah, and, and, and they'll tell you, oh, yeah, the, here's where they're full of crap on this or here's where this is a big stretch. So, so yeah, you can, you know, the little explorers could have monster upside, right? And if they find something, of course they will, uh, you know. Um, 
but you know, I, I, I like developers and the, the producers and, and, um, so the care and maintenance names, um, you know, um, but, but, yeah. uh, you know, you just, you, it, it's about risk reward and it's not about, you know, I, I look at, you know, I look at a lot of when I do go on Twitter and I'll see people talk about names and stuff and, you just, you just, you can't always believe what a management team is telling you, and you just got to keep, you know, what's what's the old Russian proverb: trust but verify. I, I wouldn't even get to the trust part. I just go verify, um, is what what I would do, and um, and that's why uh, it it always helps to talk to people who've been around the space for a while. Uh, you know, the geologists, the mining engineers, because they know where the the, the bodies are buried, and they can share some insights with you. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that in a moment. Maybe some key people that the audience should think about and should follow, even if they're not part of a public listed equity, but just outside folks that are are very good, long-standing folks in the sector. I'll get back to that one, but just briefly, Mike. You know, one area that we don't talk about a lot, or we, you know, there's not a lot of discussion on it, and that's exit strategy down the road. Can you just talk about? Maybe just a few things that come to mind. I don't want you to share everything uh, or, you know, and I know you won't anyway, but maybe you can just talk about maybe some key things that you might be looking for when it comes to exit. Maybe things in the fuel cycle, pricing, term contract volume, maybe mm-hmm. forward supply, sentiment indicators, total sector capitalization. What's maybe a few things that go through your head that you think are maybe some trigger points for considering an exit? Sure. Um the easiest by far was to invest in uranium. Um, so that's the easy decision, right? Because it's all about risk reward. You know, I see I see people you know, uh, comment sometimes, uh, oh, when is it going to turn off? Who cares? Uh, I mean, if you've got, I don't know, 20, 30% downside, 35% downside, and you got hundreds of percent upside, if that's what you're math shows, right? That That's what our math shows, but somebody else could have a completely different view, and I respect that. Um, it's risk reward, and um, so the buying portion for us is easy. It's not easy in terms of which companies to do that. That requires work, but the hard part is when do you sell? And and this gets into the art of investing. And you know, for every company we have an investment in, we you know we have a a view on what that what the uh, net present value of those cash flows are. And right, so. And and there's historical context to put them in, and what should say, you know, what will somebody pay for that? And and uh, you know it's more um, analytical, and you know that's that's math, right? That you can get your head around that. And then that, but then the hard part becomes where are you in the animal spirits portion of it, and where are you in the sentiment portion of it? And you know for for us it comes down to what's the value of the company that we think it's worth, right? So we have what's what's what, what's a stupid price where you just back up the truck on a company because it's just been thrown out and it makes no sense? There's that price. And then there's what's a price we think it's, this is worth mid-cycle? Um, and uh, what's a fair mid-cycle multiple to pay, which we, are, which we gravitate towards? Um, and then there's that portion of it where is, geez, um, I know from uh, you know, being around uh, as, a, as a professional investor for many, many years, you know, I, 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 I speak to people, I have contacts, and I could say from from having the fund, right? You can see we get a lot of inbound calls, sometimes more than others, um, and it's the you're looking, and, and I could tell from the quality of of the calls, I could tell from uh, maybe the status of the people calling in, uh, where the interest levels are starting to uh, lie, and 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 as you know, like in any of these, because this is so abandoned and it's less abandoned now, but, but as, as it turns, you know, people like to own what's working, right? People don't like catching falling knives. I, I don't mind it as in, in terms of, I think I have valuation down uh, support. Um, but, uh, but if, if you're starting to see a lot of people pile in, and you start to see the narrative start to go to from uh, to giddiness and euphoria, and then I, you know, um, uh, the hard part is selling because the valuation might tell you it's time to to hit the hit the exit sign, but you need to you know gauge as to where where the money the amount of money that can flow into the sector, 
and you know, typically the way we do it is you, uh, you know, you don't. It, it, not everything's black and white. Is 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 you might if you're if you're in a position if you're you have the good fortune to when a cycle turns to start to take your costs out um, and you start to trim out of a position. Um, you know, you just kind of have to gauge. You know, I. I <clears throat> And Twitter is not that. Twitter, Twitter is a, uh, anti center It will be a great gauge because uh, I could see it um, when, when, when the spot price of uranium is is moving. All of a sudden, it it goes crazy, right? And yeah. Um, yeah. and 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 you have you've seen nothing yet. Uh, so, um, but when when the institutions start plowing in and they've been plowing in, that's kind of when and you start to see all the sell side starting to turn and all seeing the obvious case and how obvious it is. You want to start looking a couple of steps ahead and say, okay, you know, what's my upside? What's what, who's the incremental capital that's coming in here, right? And uh, you want to. That's when we start to think about it, when you start to scale out of it. And individual equity consideration, where they are valuation-wise, sentiment, you talked about that. What about macro factors, about where are we at with the term contracting? Where are we with with mm-hmm. the macro picture for the actual fundamentals? Have they turned upside down? What do you think on that side? Yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's a really good question. Um, you know, we're, you see, we look at it, right, you start to think about <clears throat> uh the factors that come into play is we've been through a major destocking period uh, in the utilities. Uh, they've been destocking for quite some time, drawing down their inventories. And inventory levels, uh, as we look at the utility balance sheets, you know, a lot of things we see in the, you know, you'll look at the EIA report that came out recently, and you see, I think, 19 over 18 U.S. inventories were up a percent. Um, but you know, we look at the balance sheets of utilities, and we look to see who is buying that, and because you don't see the individual names, and and it, it was it was a a company that made a really big purchasing dollar, but most of the utilities were down, mean, uh, reasonable to meaningful. Um, so it's a composition of that, and uh, so you, we we look at you know as I as 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 we think about this cycle and as as it evolves. Is we've just gone through this destocking, and um, nobody would, uh, most people would might think we're crazy, but we're thinking about when we think about supply and demand, we're thinking about okay, well there there we think there's a major deficit for quite some time, but that doesn't include restocking, and restocking means giving them that security of supply, and so uh, that that's that's something that we 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 focus a, a great deal on. Um, I, I forget the genesis of the question. <laughs> Go back to, um, I don't know why, I just I need to write that down. Give me the question. Yeah, so we talk about equity valuations, and I think that's an area that people need to pay attention to, sentiment, yeah. obviously. And then yeah. just the macro factors for how, oh, how yeah, 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 the, yeah. So, and the yeah. fundamentals. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, so like we the restock. The, where, yeah, so it's not necessarily, you know, look, I could tell you that over the last, since 2014, you know, utilities have contracted at about 41% roughly of their needs, annual needs. Uh, in the last peak, they were contracting at 120 to 150%. So, but now we look at it and we have, you know, we kind of think about, okay, well, so they've covered their needs for a while um, when, the, when the contracting cycle starts. But what portion of that are they going to want to top, top up? Right. And so and that will come from conversations that we have with folks and to get a sense for the contracting appetite um, and folks in the fuel cycle as to what that is. So we look at that. Um, the spot market, we think, will be tight for quite some time. So it's, you know, again, spot is something that that's more of an interest to folks who aren't um, paying attention to the other parts of the fuel cycle. So, you know, when you start to see. Uh, those mid to latter years of the 20s start to be over contracted, meaning far in excess of their annualized demand. Right? If you go back in some years, you were seeing uh, back in oh six, seven, eight, nine that time period, you were seeing uh, 210, 20, 40, 50 million pounds being contracted. Um, when you start to see those numbers, you have to then look for what does the world look like? You know. Um, 
if, if uh, uh, from a coverage standpoint. And when you start to get covered, uh, really fully covered, then you start to say, okay, well, you know, maybe there's the, not that contracting upside here, right? Because again, it's cyclical, and and you're 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 looking here for this mean reversion. Uh, look, we 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 do the math, and the price of uranium doesn't need to get above seventy dollars, seventy five dollars. Didn't last time either, by, by the way. And where to go? One thirty seven. Why? Because that's the, it's investing is human nature. And it's fear and greed. And when it's when it's at sixty or seventy, and now all of a sudden these 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 guys who are in a position to provide those pounds are going to step back and say, "Yeah, well, you know what? Because you you, you because you you guys weren't in the market, and when we told you you needed to listen to us, you didn't. And um, and we've had really difficult shareholder create value creation the last uh, eight nine years and uh, our stock price has gotten crushed now we have to make up for it so we're not actually going to sell you those pounds and you know that's there's that's the the pendulum that swings and the leverage and that's how prices get higher and then people people if they have been following a a individual uh, uh entity that's been giving them their guidance and and all of a sudden they're saying oh wait maybe that's wrong and then now now where are they going to start from scratch <clears throat> and say okay, and they're gonna say, well, the price is telling us we need to pay more, and we don't get in trouble for paying more, so we'll pay more. Um, you know, so much of it is is just human emotion. That's most of investing. The like, math right. is easy. So, yep, that same group was also wrong during the last cycle. <laughs> yeah, matter, of the, fact, uh, matter of fact, their yeah, whole this, history might be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yep, absolutely. So, Let's move on here. Just moving through some to some audience questions. There was a question that came in about when you ex, when and where do you expect an announcement of a restart? Uh, perhaps forgetting about Cigar Lake. What's your thoughts there, Mike? Yeah, you know, um, it's a good question. Um, I don't, you know, I'm I'm not so much focused on the date of a restart as I am the rate of a restart. You know, there's there's many different ways to skin a cat, and I just think out loud if I'm if I'm because I you know they're different beasts right but if I'm Cameco I've got to be in the market buying pounds because I I have sales commitments that are far exceed what my production capabilities are so I could go buy pounds in the market and if you buy spot pounds and you pay up for it well a, a good portion of their book has exposure to rising prices right now their contract book but uh, obviously if you could produce tier one pounds. Um, you're probably better off if you're a tier one producer, right, than going out and paying higher. But they also know that by paying higher prices, it's going to, you know, it, it serves as a a uh, jump start uh, to utilities uh, uh, being able to go in and, and, and it moves. And again, you go back to the third party, it moves term pricing higher. It gives them the ability, it gives them cover to move what they think. Because term pricing isn't where prices are done. It's it's the lowest offer. That's what term pricing is. It, the, the way it's reported, um, it's not right. the, it's it's not where a price is going, right. So it's 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 so stupid the way this industry everything about it. But it, that serves to an advantage of an equity investor. It, but it's absurd. But yep. anyway, um, uh, so you know, I think as far as so if, if cigar, you know, they have a lot of things, right? They obviously commercial factor is playing into it, the health and safety of their workers for COVID. Um, uh, and, you know, if you if you do work like we do up in, in the northern uh, communities, the indigenous communities up there and, and the First Nations, um, uh, you, you know, there you're still seeing a, a bit of a, a they just had a big spike in the last couple of days. I, cases. Uh, but but that being said, at some point in time, they're going to want to bring the mine on just to be able to get cheaper pounds. But I think the commercial aspect then comes in is what's the rate they bring the mine back on, right? Because right. I think the market just looks at the date, right? What's the date? What day are they coming on? Let's game that. And well, nameplate. Yep. And, and nameplate. Exactly. And that's not how we think about it. We think about, okay, well, at some point they're going to bring it back online, but they're coming on at 18, 15, 12, or 9. Well, I don't think it's coming back anywhere near 18 million pounds a year. Because um, if I'm them, why would I do that? I don't need to. There's some math that goes on within there that has to figure out where can we um, be 
be better off bringing it on, um, but at, at what rate are we bringing it on? But again, who knows? You, you, again, it, it, it just – so I, I, my, my guess from talking to market participants is it's probably uh, they assume that it's a, it's, it's a full nameplate capacity when it comes on, and we think there's more of a, a, a chance that it's not. So that's that's that. And then in the Kazox, you know, um, again, you're, you're just starting to see – Again, there you're starting to see some uh, uh, regions that had opened up close back down again because the cases are spiking. But who knows where that goes, right? You have no idea. But but when we think about Kazakhstan, um, you know the Kazakhs. Uh, there, not only do you see that up to 4,000 tons coming out uh, in 2020, uh, which would uh, you didn't see that in the first half because those well fields were acidified and every well every every property is different. Um, but that that impacts production into the market for 2020. Those 4,000 tons in the back half of the year. But what you really see is there was a lot of well field development that needed to be occurring now, last month, the month before. That's going to impact we think 2021 production. So again, it's another yep. rate type thing there. So that's right. Um, you know, it, again, it's always easy in investing to go to what the um, what what what's what you think is 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 the important thing. Um, but we don't. You know, we're more focused on the rate at which they they come back uh, than the date that they come back. Yep. And similar question here: When and where do you expect to see a construction start on a greenfield project? <laughs> Good question. Uh, you know, you need to see higher prices, and that all, by the way, that all bodes well for higher prices. <laughs> um, yeah, you're going, you're going to need to see a contract in hand, and uh, I, I think it'll be a while. Um, and which all plays for the ultimate length of this cycle, um, and 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 prov- provides more leverage to those who can produce uranium in the near term or or on care maintenance. Yeah, uh, but but those make no mistake. Those projects, certain of those projects are needed. Um, but that's the utilities problem. I, I guess just pushing on to that a little bit, Mike, with greenfield side of it for a notable project. Do you gravitate more towards a Africa? Uh, so I mean, you could anyone could see our filing, and I won't talk about why we own it, but we are a, the technical term is a substantial, um, but we are a filer on Paladin, um, uh, Paladin Energy, which has, uh, you know, their, their project in Africa, um, in, in Namibia, the Langer Heinrich. So obviously, yes, we do gravitate towards, uh, towards that, but we also, um, we, we are, um, we can absolutely see the value, uh, on a couple of projects in Canada, um, that we think are, very meaningful, and we think our uh, will be um, will be needed, and uh, we think there's a lot of upside in them. You know, it's not either or. We can see a role for different projects. It, it, it all comes down to what are people willing to pay for it, and what price are we going to pay for it when we get into it, and what do we think the upside versus downside is. Right. Yeah, and I think that kind of played in with the where, or I, I guess the the win question of later stage projects that we know have a longer time frame versus uh, new green fields that could be obviously a little shorter, you know, mid cycle yeah. time frame. Yeah. Yeah. And it depends on the uh, it depends on who the buyer is, right? So uh, as as we think about how the cycle unfolds, where who are the big buyers? Well, the, who are the big players? Uh, the Russians and the Chinese are, you know, they dominate the fuel cycle and they vertically integrate the fuel cycle. Hey, we'll we'll build a reactor for you. We'll finance it for you. We'll operate it for you. We'll provide the uranium conversion enrichment fabrication. Here we go. Vertically integrated. Here we are. Um, oh, by the way, we don't have a lot of indigenous uranium, so we need to go buy it. Um, you know, I don't think Russia is coming into the U.S. again and buying them. I don't. Uh, I don't think China is, uh, you know, it, you got to go through hoops if you're these countries and more Western countries to, uh, if you're China or Russia, you you know, because of the sensitivity of the of the commodity, and we've seen how the uranium one what played, it didn't play well in the U.S. in terms of uh, how that all transpired. But 
uh, yep. you're they're more likely to find uh, projects in in Africa. It's it's more likely for them to be there. And then and then you have a whole another emerging area, which is the Middle East, right? The sovereign funds that would be inv uh, involved in in providing and and you know there can be some interesting stuff up in Canada there. So uh, yep. you know it's it's re it's regional. We're seeing that too. I'm I'm certainly seeing a lot of that going on over on the base at precious metal sites, specifically, namely uh, Zhejiang mining out of China. Significant presence firing up in Africa, uh, Serbia, Middle East, yeah. uh, South yeah. America, Central America. We're seeing a lot of activity on them collecting up, typically Canadian yeah. listed companies. But yeah, certainly interesting points you bring up, and the wealth funds coming out of the Middle East. You're absolutely right. We're seeing activity of some of those over into the precious metal space. And so yep. uranium's in a similar set of circumstances coming down the pipe. Looking out a little bit on long-term contracting, Mike, do you see that 2022 is a key year for term contracting as these roll off? What are you seeing there? Do you see that as really oh, an ideal time frame? Well, well that, that's a whole lot. Uh, no, we think they've rolled off much more than people think they have. I mean, our our proprietary work believes that uncovered demand is much higher than the market thinks it is, um, meaningfully so, uh, but through a reconstruction of said party uh, as analysis, we, we can't reconstruct what current uh, uncovered demand requirements are. So we're very comfortable with our uncovered demand, and, and no, we would think that that's a, it's sooner than, way sooner than 2022 um, when you start to see it. Now, again, most companies, most contracts have NDA uh, non-disclosures in there, right? So you might hear about pounds being signed, but they, you know, the smaller promotional ones are going to say, "We signed a contract with X." Um, uh, you know, don't expect Cameco to come out and ring the bell every time they sign a contract. That's not going to happen. Um, yep. Uh, they'll update you quarterly, uh, that type of thing. But we know we we think that you will we we our view is that uh, this isn't a quote false dawn. Our view is that uh, utilities the the smart ones the really the more savvy ones are aware of this uh, becoming more aware of the supply demand situation and we think that it, it's just you know you get through the co the COVID thing has been a big deal because it's been a focus for them to make sure these reactors are running. And, and again, these fuel buyers are involved in all of that. It's they're not just sitting there buying uranium, but but uh, you know we think you start to you, know, you start to see an acceleration of that. Is it three months or six months or nine months? Don't know, um, but we don't think it's two years. We think it's sooner okay. than that. So so starting potentially in 2021. And what do you think that the time frame is for the for that contracting cycle to ramp up and pass? Do you think that's a four to five year time frame? What, what's your thoughts on that? You know, it depends. Uh, well, it's a good question uh, in the sense that when will they have their needs covered or when will they continue to keep contracting? Because they'll keep contracting, we think, beyond when their needs are covered for some t for a little bit of time. Um, yeah. Because again, you, you get into the fear factor of it. So, um, you know, it could, it, it just, it, it could be. And, and, and here's the other issue you have is, um, you know, Cameco has X amount of capacity. The Kazakhs, as you're going to see when we talk about this, you know, <laughs> they have, they are what they are. Um, they they can produce X amount of pounds and X plus more, but X X plus beyond what they have even said they can do. Even looking at their own documents in the prospectus costs a lot of money to do. So then you've got to start getting into these other projects that require a lot of time, a lot of money um, to build, and they're never on time and they're never on budget. And so those are not going to get built until they have contracts in hand. Uh, nobody's going to finance them. And so, you know, you could see this fear come into where you start to see over contracting, which we saw last time. I, you know, it wouldn't surprise us to see that. And, uh, you know, that how long could that take? Um, depends how how uh, anxious you, the producers are to sign into them. Because if I'm a producer, if I'm Cameco, and I'm sitting there. You know, we see the, we see everyone say, well, they can fill their order book at forty-five dollars. <laughs> um, 
Sure, sure. Uh, no. Um, but if, if I've just had nine years, eight, eight years of my stock price getting hammered because there's been a market that's oversupplied, and I know that this market's turning, you think I'm going to sit there and fill up an order book at those prices? Are you out of your mind? No, we're going to sit back and say, keep coming. Come on, come to daddy. Um, um, so, yep. uh, yeah, it, it, who, I, you know, I don't know how long the contracting cycle will last. It, it's an, it, it will be evolutionary. Yeah, absolutely. And, and good points about Kazataprom recapitalization, new capital investments. That's not going to happen until this sector is well on its way. Absolutely. Um, look, yeah. look, Riaz, Riaz Rizvi, the chief commercial officer who we know well, um, he said it publicly at their at their analyst day. The world needs by 2030 two to three more Kazataproms. He's not making it up. <laughs> He's not making it up. And, yep. and 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 all you got to do is read that 600 page prospectus and look at the demand, look at the decline curve, right? So when I see someone say, oh, "Yeah, the Kazakhs," oh, shut up. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Kazakhs are a great producer. They've created, uh, they've changed the uranium world. Now what? That's known. That's in the numbers. Don't tell me what happened yesterday. Don't tell me what happened to why prices got here. Schmuck, tell me why prices are going higher. Not you, um, but average schmuck bear case. <laughs> that is not our thing. Is is you know t now tell me because you don't have a case, right? Don't tell me that the oh the Kazakhs have tremendous no shit, and it's going to cost a ton of money to bring it out of the ground, and they're done, right. uh, ab above what their existing capacity is, and, and you know, and we by the way keep them fully ramped through 2030. And 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 they're not going to come anywhere close to that. E even their own documentation says they can't do that. Um, so, yeah. Yep. You talked about carry trade a little while ago. You touched on that real quick. I just want to ask what your thoughts are uh, from an audience question here. Is the carry trade really a bear market vehicle, and does it really get shelved in a rising term and spot price environment? Yeah, when the spreads collapse, like you know, when so they 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 sell a little bit. Uh, they sell one to two years out, you know, make it up. They're paying 23 bucks a pound. They're selling out at 30 bucks a pound. Yeah, that's nice, right? Now, as spot prices come up and you haven't seen the term price there, you know, you'll you'll step. But you know, there's that's they'll be focused on on. It's not there right now. The carry trade, meaning that the spreads have collapsed, and you're what you're seeing is uh, in this particular environment is is a liquidity issue for them. You know, there was, uh, people don't talk about it, but there was uh, one utility out there that got, uh, uh, th th that there was a carry trade supposed to be delivered and they, they, they had a challenge with their, the trader had a challenge with their credit line. And so, um, you know, it, it, will it be there? You've got to have the pounds there, right? So the pounds have to be available. Um, they have to yep. be able to go out into the spot market and secure those pounds. And if those pounds aren't there, they can't do it. It's been like crack cocaine, the carry trade for the last several years for both traders and utilities. When my contracts expire, why do I need to re-up if I can go out and sell into the carry trade? Look, Riaz uh, or uh, Gallum Permatop stood up on stage and he said it in the, in the interview in the UXC Weekly. If you're a trader, the world has changed for you. You need to recognize it. I don't know where you carry traders are going to get your pounds because it ain't coming from us. And and that's the reality of it. So it's the availability of the pounds. And if those pounds aren't available, yeah, that's not going to be there. And and you're seeing it now. There's very few carry trades being done. Yeah. Um, but and and so and that again that takes time. And you're not. And and you asked what lessons learned is probably. The the, the 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 lack of of fire, the lack of uh, got to get it done yesterday, that occurs um, in 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 the in the buying process. It doesn't change the fundamentals. It's just what triggers that. You know, COVID here triggered it. None of those pounds were sold into the spot market from these mines that went offline. And if you do the math, and and there was just a little bit more, you know, you by the way, you see 21 million pounds traded. That's not Kamika in April. That's not Kamika. That's the traders were going crazy buying, buying, just going back and forth. Um, and you've seen a location spread evolve in the market where Kamiko pounds are at a premium to Converdine and Comirex pounds were the delivery points. 
Yep. Um, so, you know, the, the, yeah, Kamika has been in there, but they, these guys haven't been jamming it up. And so, uh, I, when those, when, when the trader can't, cause they're not going to go short the market. Well, some have, but, but if, if you're in a rising market and you decide to do a carry trade with uncovered and uncommitted pounds, you're going to get your head handed to you. And yeah. I don't, I, I don't think they'll do that. There will be a time for it to return, but right now, no. Yeah, yeah, um, right. So moving on here, is COVID an or equal to what happened with cigar and ranger floods last time? Yeah, yeah. So you know, one of the things we did is, uh, in I don't know if I put it in one of our presentations, but one of the things we we found uh, the exercise we did a while ago was, uh, if I'm a fuel buyer and I'm uh, in 2005 and I'm looking out the next five years and I'm using consensus numbers as to what the next five years supply demand deficit looks like uh, the, what's the surplus or deficit well i would have seen that if i was using consensus numbers that over the next five years uh and in late 05 that there's about a 72 million pound surplus of uranium and then you fast forward to the flood at cigar lake the next year and you uh and you say okay well geez well all these pounds coming online we don't know when they're going to come on what does the next five years look like um it never went into deficit. It was a actually consensus numbers miraculous. Very oddly, go figure. Huh. Um, it actually showed a surplus of 90 million pounds, um, even with Cigar Lake not coming online. And that's that's kind of a pixie dust mass where you can change demand numbers and do all sorts of stuff. But at the end of the day, there was still a surplus of uranium. There was not a deficit of uranium, and prices went up threefold. Um, here today, if you were to look at consensus numbers and that same five year forward, even consensus is calling for a a a, a five year period if you put it together because the consensus won't do that for you. Um, and but if you piece it all together, um, there's not a 70 million pound surplus. There even consensus's math would show there's a 20 to 25 million pound deficit over these next five years. Um, so it's. Um, it's there. There's not there. I mean, the math doesn't support lower prices. Yep. And with Kazataprom, just briefly here, not selling pounds mm -hmm. into the spot market, Mike. How long do you see that that will continue? That would continue. There. I mean, this. They don't need to. You know, when they came in in '17, they cut back. Uh, and you know, once they decided to privatize, now now it's 25 percent of the public is floated, but. Um, they came in and they realized in 17 when they went through, you know, the whole Mc McKinsey privatization thing and getting getting their sh their house in order, uh, changing management teams, bringing in Western educated Kazakhs to run this thing and, and other Western uh, thinking people. Um, this was um, commercially driven people, I should say. This was a uh, they, they cut back. They, they took a lot of tons out of the market. And 17 and 18, they had to go kind of beg for pounds because they weren't selling into the spot. So it's not like they just decided to do it. Uh, 19, they they had a really good uh, year with sales commitments, uh, and and in 2020 they're in great shape. And they're keenly aware that a, 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 a rising price is better for them than selling more uranium. And they know that if they sell more uranium, and they don't want more market share, they're at 40 percent now. They're they're they'll make more money with higher prices than they will with more market share and, and lower prices. And again, it goes back to, it's a slippery slope for them because yeah, they, they, they I mean, they're a dominant producer, but again, they can only produce so much. And, and also they've been a bit beneficiary of a weak Tenge and that could turn around at any time. Um, but uh, they're, they're, they, they, they only have so many pounds that they can economically produce. And not every mine is is 15. You know, those costs that you see now in all in sustaining cost of 15, go back five years when the Tenge was, was stronger and those costs were 30 bucks. And so they're, they're not, you know, they're, they have delivered on everything they have said for f almost four years now, three, four years. So I don't think that you're going to see them as a spot market uh, seller. I just don't, I, I, I don't buy it. Yep. And again, let them do if they did it doesn't solve the, the deficit problem no it doesn't and just moving on to that a lot more credible over the last couple of years uh, certainly yep. i think you've seen that as well and yep. your your thoughts talking term price and spot price on this question 
you know, we have a disclosure issue on the term price. Where do you see the term price moving? That's, that's into an understatement, 20? but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where, where do you see the term price moving in 2021? And really, where when will that term price start to adjust for what's actually been signed? You know, that's, a, uh, that's another good question. Um, I, I In 2020, I, I don't know. It, it depends. Um, do I think you need to see $50 prices? Yeah, I think you do. Will they get there in 2021? I don't know. If they don't, then you don't get mines built. Then you don't get mines coming back off care and maintenance. Um, uh, again, at the rate at which they could. Uh, does Cigar Lake come back? I don't know. Maybe it does, but does it come back at full production? I can't see that. Um, so, you know, that's I, I I would think um, you know we're making that bet that they're up around there by 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 then. Um, it doesn't take a lot, you know. It's yeah. it, it it doesn't take a lot because these you know I don't I, I I I don't care what the published price is of term because that's that's a nonsensical number to me. Um, where in terms of how it's reported, um, uh, do I think prices have been signed in the 40s? I do. So to get it to the 50 50 plus, I don't think it's that Herculean. Um, now, I, I honestly think it now comes back to Windows Cameco and, and some of the others want to sign them. Um, yep. And at what price did they, they want to sign them at? Because I think you're seeing that power shift. At least that's our view. Yes, and as because mm-hmm. Adaprom and Cameco continue to sign those in bigger volumes up at those prices, that'll just barely be disclosed anyway. They'll, they'll, yep. talk, they'll talk rough numbers anyway, so they, you have a price reporting mechanism through those. That's exactly right, and it been, and then it just kind of marginalizes what the price reporting. And look, there's if you look at, I, and I'm not going to get into it um, just because of copyright stuff. I can't, I can't get into um, because all that consensus stuff is behind a paywall. But but there's the leading price indicators that go into where pricing is going are are not in our view leading price indicators. So um, they actually have an opposite of, uh, result. But yeah, it will get there, yep. and then people will chase it. That's our view. Talking about U.S. utilities that are uncovered in the near term, what options do they have now besides term deals? And are they more willing to start term contracting due to COVID passing through here, or do you see that they'll hold up for another year or two? Uh, I think that the Russian suspension agreement is a big deal to them. You know, they uh, right where no more than 20% uh, uranium can come in to, uh, in the uh, in in uh, enriched uranium product into the country from Russia in any given year, and that. Uh, the utilities somewhere in their infinite wisdom thought that that would expire at the end of 2020. And it's really looking for out of the Department of Commerce with where they're going with it and some uh, bipartisan legislation that's backing it up that that's not going to expire. And, and it actually looks like it could be tougher where you're bringing in 75 percent of that has to come in the form of SWU and not EUP. And then that means they have to go out and, and, re, and recontract some enrichment capacity. And then they have to go, would have to maybe, uh, uh, you know, when we look at the inventory levels of the of the uh, enrichers, they're down a lot. So then you'd have to see more uh, uranium be bought. Um, so we think that some trade policy stuff act an imped- as an impediment to contracting, which was 232, the nuclear fuel working group, whereas we think the Russian suspension agreement could act as an accelerant to, to it. Um, so I, I think it's something that, that really bears watching. Um, uh, so no, I, I think that... Um, I think that you could start to... I, and I think the smarter ones, uh, the, the, the ones that are, are more astute, there are... There, you know, look, all of these folks are smart. You got to remember the guy who's running one or two reactor, or who's buying for one or two reactors, and and they're smaller, and they're they're looking at thirty two dollar listed term price, and he, he's got to walk into his boss's office and say, ah, I want to pay fifty. And it's like, you know, they they have no sway. They want to keep their job. They're in the U.S. where where they're worried about their reactors closing. So there's not a lot of rocking the boat going on. But but that starts to emanate from the bigger the bigger ones. Uh, and right. they, you know, it, it, and it becomes water cooler talk, right? And then they, they, the FOMO starts kicking in, fear of missing out. And then it just kind of takes on a little life of its own. Mobile inventory, where are we at yep. uh, at this stage? Uh, and what do you see, if you can share a number, what do you see that's really left at this point? Yeah, I won't give you our, our total number, but it, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, uh, how do I say it without telling you what our number is? Um, we think mobile inventory is de minimis. So I'll, I'll give you a number in our secondary supply numbers. Um, you know, one of the things we you'll hear we we use 
uh, 4 million pounds a year for Japanese inventories coming in. Japanese have like 110 million pounds of inventory. We think about half of that is in fabricated fuel rods. And c can they can they break those down and sell that? Yeah, they can. Is it expensive? Yes. Or are they going to do it low? Oh, or no. Um, but how much do we think is is mobile in there? in their U-308, you know, 15 million pounds. Well, over the next 10 years, we use 4 million pounds a year. Have we seen any? No. Um, <laughs> but but to be conservative, we say, okay, that's what could happen. So when we see somebody say, oh, the Japanese are going to sell, they can sell half a million or a million pounds. Check, got it. Give us three more million pounds. Where's that coming from? And, and oh, by the way, 4 million pounds times 10 is 40. We don't think there's 15 total. Um, so we think mobile inventory is very tight. One of the jokes in this industry is the is the absolute number of inventory pounds who gives a shit doesn't matter it's a matter of how much is mobile and most of it is not mobile um yeah. we think mobile is uh if if you know we'll give you we'll we'll put in a couple year range which is <laughs> right where uh meaning not not mobile not that can hit the market tomorrow i shouldn't say that's what we think is mobile but we think commercial inventories that matter uh, uh total commercial inventories that matter are in the couple year range we think mobile inventories are literally basically what's in japan and a little bit here or there so you know not, hard, not a lot hardly any so co commercial inventories that matter a couple years uh, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the region, but but at very normal levels, some below, some a drop above. Uh, and in terms of the actual mobile that can hit the market at any given time, you're seeing it right now. It's not out there. So we think mobile inventories are tiny, tiny, tiny portion of what's out there. Excellent. And on conversion enrichment and fabrication side, do you see any yep. further shutdowns as a result of market factors or have we seen the extent of it? I think I think you uh you know who knows what covid will bring maybe one of the places get hit with another case but uh on conversion I think yeah I think it it's kind of is what it is uh enrichment um you know uh, russian suspension agreement would if 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 it goes through or it's continued and extended uh you might need to see some shifting around of where things get enriched and and uh you know that would probably uh, bode well for for Urenko, I would guess um but uh, we don't think underfeeding is an issue anymore at all. Um, we think that that capacity has been consumed. Um, so yeah, so fabrication okay. is you know that that's an important part. But we think there's capacity. You know, there that that's that part of the market's okay. Mike, is there any other places besides you know obviously where we know the cream of the crop is and the equities and the uranium side? Um, are you invested in any other parts of the fuel cycle other than physical commodity and the uranium equities? Nope, that's it. And we look at some other things, but that's where we're making our bet. Yep, same. And utilities supposedly have a fresh memory of overpaying for uranium in the last procurement right. cycle. How do you weigh their assumed desire to avoid overpaying during the coming cycle with current historically low long-term contracting volume and a large percentage of U.S. and European utilities uncovered in the coming years, especially considering the ongoing supply risks? Any thoughts there? So how can they avoid overpaying? They're going to pay higher. Overpaying is up to them. You know, depends what overpaying technically is. Like I said, you know, is seventy bucks the level? Uh, you know, and by the way, if people are listening, go seventy. It's not going to one thirty. Do the math. Look at what the equity prices will do if that's the case. They'll go bananas. Um, <laughs> but will they pay more? Yes, sure. We think they will because then, then their their emotion and lack of conviction on that price will come into play, and you know those, those same many of those buyers who who were uh, in 2004 saying I, I you know one of the great things about if you look at surveys that were done back then which i i um i think it was i might have been the nei presentation i gave talked about a survey i don't think they do it they still do them but if you look at the surveys and what fuel buyers say they're going to where the price of uranium will be out um one in five years i mean it's it's, it, <laughs> I mean, they're not worth the paper they're written on. Um, yep. So, because they're of the moment, right? So, my my guess is they will overpay. How much I don't know. You know, cycles. The thing I like about cycles is it's wash, rinse, repeat. Um, That's as right. As long as he, and as long as human beings are involved in these decisions, and you know, I think the longer a bear market goes on, the the, the more risk there is to overpaying the next time around because this complacency sets in and. You know, the more forceful a narrative becomes, the more 
reinforced you get. And, you know, one of the lessons I've learned as an investor is there are times throughout my career where, you know, you're talking about a thesis and you're whatever the sector might have been in. And as you're talking about it, you start to hear yourself and you start to say, it pops into your head, you know, I got to double check that. I got to let me go back on that thing and make sure that I'm right. You know, and, and as you're talking to a friend on the phone, you're talking to another investor, right? Not publicly, but you're talking to another investor and you're like, I, I repeat the thesis over and over again. It's so rote that you run the risk of getting stale in your thesis and you run the risk of let things happening that aren't, that you're missing. And it's something that you don't know early in your career as a, as an investor, um, but when it happens to you enough, you start to get those signals, that little pinging in your brain and your stomach that say, you know, I got to revisit this. I'm tired of hearing myself talk about this. Um, and, you know, obviously that's something that I'm always cognizant of with uranium. And I can very gladly say that not only do we not get those pings, but those pings go, go the opposite direction and say, holy shit. This is even more of a reason to support it, uh, like not support it, but that supports our thesis um, and still always looking for where we're wrong. I think what, what will happen, though, is there's there's nothing is more empowering than than facts and numbers. And you can have all of the conviction you want in something, but you know if it's supported by facts and numbers, not other people's facts and numbers, but your own facts and numbers. And my sense is the the overwhelming number of participants that matter in this fuel cycle are supported by others, facts and numbers. And I think when that starts to come into play and they start to doubt the others facts and numbers and they don't have the time or the wherewithal to do their own facts and numbers while markets are moving, that's when emotion and fear kicks in. And when that emotion and fear kicks in, that's when they shit their pants. And that's when they're willing to pay whatever they need to pay. And again, they're not going to get in trouble for it. Yeah. And and you can tell from talking to them. I could tell from talking to the traders. There are some traders I talk to where I just think like, are you a clown? They're not all of them. Not but are you honestly believe the bullshit you're trying to tell me, that every lie that's coming out of your mouth, you think I believe that? Your job in an opaque physical market is to talk your book. I get that. But don't come to a analytical gunfight with both hands tied behind your back <laughs> because you're talking to a guy on the other side of two guys on the other side of the table. We at least we've put the effort in to understand this, the, the dynamics in the market. Um, but, but, and you could tell the more you speak to people who has done their work and who hasn't. And, that's, and when I say their work, I don't mean that they do the work that they're supposed to do, but it all goes back to where does that work emanate from and, and what, what does the influence does that have on the market? And that's where we get great conviction that just say, okay, we think, and again, it's like, where's the price go? I don't know. Where do I think it? Where do I know it needs to go? Yeah, well, that's where it needs to go. Uh, you know, where we, you know, set in that range. But, but then, then it's it's the whole human element to this thing. Yeah, good point about the the survey that you mentioned earlier that was worthless in that consideration worthless. because because you're absolutely right in this type of market, it's going to be standard procedure to overpay well, because of well, the well, I think yes, you're right, Andrew. And if you want to think about the whole the whole rationale of a survey. You're surveying people that most of their research on the industry comes from what you're providing them in terms of research. So now you're going to go survey them and ask them to tell you what you have been telling them for the last a quarter, six months, a year. It's a reinforcing circle jerk. That's all that is. And that's why it's wrong all the time, most of the time. <laughs> They're responding to a survey with, yeah. with the report from the surveyor in their hand. Yep, 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 yep. Sure. Let me answer your questions with the cheat sheet in front of me, but you know, the cheat sheet's not right. Okay, got it. <laughs> Check. So as your time in the sector has passed, Mike, what people, maybe not those on management teams and boards, have become helpful to you during this time? Any particular people you'd like to mention that the audience should keep an eye on? Nope. That's why we run Sachem Cove. <laughs> You know, that's what we do. That's that's our proprietary stuff. You know, we speak to people that might be under the radar, but, you know, I'm, that, that we're not going to share publicly. Uh, and to, you know, management teams, I, you know, I just don't get into who we who we speak to, what we speak to. Um, 
But there are, you know, that's what people need to do, right? To go, go out and just uh, find those sources that do it. But there, you know, I'll tell you one that I think has a very good handle on the macro uranium and, and the movings of the market. I think Brandon Monroe has a good feel, really good feel for the macro uranium. Brandon's the CEO of Bannerman. So I think Brandon, he he gets the, the moving parts in the macro uranium market. So that that's one from, from that side. And I mean, that's, I'm just trying to think publicly that they're out there. Dustin, he's fairly public now that he's come out. Yeah, there you go. We do. We speak to Dustin. Um, but that's, that's one. Um, but all the others are industry uh, people. From a macro standpoint, you know, we're, we don't speak to anyone that's going to, that's going to enlighten us on the macro uranium on different parts of it. We speak to people on companies, on projects, geologists, engineers. Uh, that's that's where a lot of our learnings come from. Um, you're really, really, really hard pressed to find people who have modeled this out. Segra Capital has uh, Art and Adam at, at uh, who run another uranium fund. Uh, you know those guys are exceptional. Um, they've modeled out the macro in their own way, their own world, and we come to it at the same conclusions, um, completely independently of one another. Um, but but they, uh, they're they somebody who we hold in extremely high regard um, in terms of the moving parts of the macro uranium. Uh, but, but it gets really thin after that. Now, we do speak to people that help us in each portion of it uh, inform our opinion, but a lot of the times it's really we find out that uh, more than anything is somebody who you might think really knows something really is just kind of winging it or they are working off of uh, some, someone else's work. So, you know, this is yep. really just this is this is just grinding it out and just putting those numbers down. Any other areas of the natural resource markets that you have interest in at this point, Mike, and maybe where you see some opportunity? And lastly, what is your view on gold? My opinion on gold is, do I, I'm not a gold bug. I don't buy the, you know, I'm not saying I don't buy. I mean, everyone, I don't have enough of an informed opinion on, you know, fiat currencies are exploding. If, you know, inflation is going to go through, blah, 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 blah. You know the drill. Um, do I think there's, um, do I think that there's not enough um, uh, supply out there? Probably. Do I think that the supply demand that there's not been enough big discoveries? Yeah, I could, I, I see that. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, all uranium all the time, all nuclear power all the time. Um, you know, I do keep an eye on, uh, Tim and I keep an eye on the uh, the natural gas sector, you know, some of the, hey, what ifs. Um, you know, I, I for a while have thought the shale plays are a bit of a Ponzi scheme, and um, you would see uh, a production cut. And, um, you know, the world lives off the fact that natural gas is buck uh, seventy two dollars and you know, uh, at, at $5 natural gas, it's a very different world for uh, U.S. Uh, utilities who have morphed to natural gas. Um, it, it, natural gas had always been 8 9 $10. And, um, you know, now that people, again, perceive it never to go higher again, if it were to creep up, all of a sudden the economics of running those natural gas plants aren't as attractive. And it'd be, uh, in the U.S., and again, this is all in our numbers. Um, we assume that it doesn't, but it can. And if it does, that's all upside um, because it puts less pressure on the economics of, of, of uh, nuclear power compared to natural gas. Uh, and I, you know, when I say natural gas, uh, shale plays are a Ponzi scheme. I don't mean, you know, it's just it's it, it meaning that. Throwing good money after bad and going out and and, and raising raising debt, uh, issuing debt, putting it in the ground and not generating the cash flows, and then having to go out and issue more debt. Right? If we produce more, we'll generate. No, you don't. Um, so, but but uh, you know, and uh, we'll see. We'll see where that plays. It's not any major portion of our thesis. But uh, focused on we're focused on nuclear power and uranium twenty four seven. No interest in going out and buying the equity of bankrupt shale plays. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe in post, maybe in post reorg, uh, but no, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me go buy some Chesapeake. Um, joking. Um, no, I know it's uh, yeah, it's interesting, right? Well, Mike, uh, best way for folks to reach out to you if you want to offer that. Oh gosh, go our, through our website. 
through it through okay. our website. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a comment section there uh, that you guys can you know, they can fill it out and stuff like that. Uh, you know, Twitter. I'm not going to get in a public debate about our you know the numbers and stuff like that. Um, but a couple times a week, three times a week, uh, I, I check that, and that's pretty yeah, that's pretty much it. Very well, Mike. Well, I think we've had a good chat, ran some good time here. And unless you have any other thoughts, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure and uh, hope you're staying safe up in New York State and looking forward to having you back soon. Thank you, man. Same here. I, I, sounds like things are functioning quite well in Panama um, from a COVID standpoint. And it sounds like you guys are weathering the storm down there. Temperatures are fantastic and glad to be here. That's great. So appreciate you, you coming on, Mike. Oh, my pleasure, Andrew. Well, it was good catching up, man.